thing I want to talk to you about is um, some of the Labour Party spokespeople, uh, the, 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 cab the shadow cabinet on the media um, are coming up with various reasons for not um, having public ownership. I'd like to play you uh, just some of them here. Um, I've said as a shadow chancellor that I'm not going to make any spending commitment where I can't say where the money's going to come from because you saw the problems that Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng and the Conservative Party got into last year where they started making uh, unfunded commitments to, ta to cut taxes and that crashed the economy, pushing up mortgage rates and borrowing costs um, for everybody else. So look, I'm not going to um, announce a, a load of, uh, you know, money to, to nationalise companies where um, I don't think that's going to deliver for customers. But we have said um, specifically... Do you think the existing the companies either are delivering for customers or can do? Well, look, I think that with water, for example, in the answer to Geraldine's question at the beginning, you've got to have tough regulation that actually bites, that says to companies, when you're delivering a public service like water, you can't pay out massive bonuses and dividends. But why haven't we now? I mean, the, there, is a the there is a water regulator, there is an energy well, regulator, and they both seem to be completely toothless. Well, that's the responsibility of the government. I just wondered if you would consider renationalising the water companies in order to save our beautiful rivers from pollution. Uh, Joe, uh, I think, you know, it's one of the things I've looked at is water um, nationalisation because I think for many people there's a deep concern about what's happening with water, not just the prices, but also um, in relation to pollution yeah, um, into yeah. our rivers and into our beaches. Um, Joe, um, that renationalising water costs a lot of money and at the moment the economy is badly damaged and I'm conscious that if we have the privilege of coming into government and I know we've got to earn every vote if we get that far, um, we've got to be very careful what we spend our available money on. And there are difficult choices to be made, Joe. You know, do we spend our money on the next generation of doctors and nurses coming through or do we spend it on water um, nationalisation? And in the current circumstances, um, my priority would be to spend it on the next generation of doctors and nurses. Um, well, we use the, as far as the energy companies are concerned, we use the French company EDF. So any profits they make is going back to the French exchequer. Whereas if um, mm. our utility companies weren't renationalised, then any profits would go back to the British exchequer. Surely that would be better. Well, Annie, would I think. Would you ever renationalise Sukia? Well, look, I, I'm not in favour of nationalisation. I mean, there's a different ways of doing business, but the top-down version of nationalisation I don't think really works, and I'm not in favour of that. Uh, now, now, Prem, what, he, we've got three reasons why not to have uh, public ownership or nationalisation. One is the top-down. That was the last one. It's, it, he doesn't like that top-down system. That's one. I don't know how that one comes about. And then the second one is if we do public ownership, then it, we'll have no money for the NHS. Uh, do you want do you want uh, public ownership or do you want doctors effectively? Which is a bit of a harsh statement, to, a choice to make there. And the, and the third one by Rachel Reeves was um, it will crash the economy and we won't uh, be able to pay our mortgages if we have public ownership. These just seem made up. I mean, they they they, they, they there's no consistency on why not. Uh, what's your view? Do they just not want public ownership? Uh, or is there any, are these real reasons? Well, I don't believe a single word that I heard from a Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeve. That is kindergarten politics uh, and, and economics. Let me just sort of first provide the background as to why they are saying what they are saying. Now, we in this country had a right-wing coup. It started in the late 1970s. There are many aspects of this. One aspect of this was to restructure the state so that it becomes a guarantor of corporate profits. So you had privatizations, PFI, outsourcing, and things like that. Second is to uh, ensure that, that the rate of return to capital increases. That is why nurses are paid less. That is why people's real wages are lagging behind. And they indulged uh, that, that the purpose of that project is really to discipline the working class so that it becomes a wholly subservient to capital. And Labour, the current Labour leadership is basically uttering that discourse. 
Now, when they say we can't afford it, my immediate response is, let us imagine there is a banking crash tomorrow. What would they do? Would they be saying, oh dear, we can't afford it? No. So at the last uh, banking crash, uh, it happened when Labour was in office, the state set aside 1,162 billion pounds of guarantees and cash to rescue the banks. 895 billion pound of quantitative easing was provided to speculators. It is now close to a trillion pounds. More recently, the state handed out COVID contracts, mainly to Tory donors and, and cronies, for which we got very little in return. More recently, about a hundred billion pound has been handed to the energy sector because of the fear that uh, uh, people would not be able to pay their energy bills. That means energy companies will have a liquidity crisis and they would go bust. So when, when, when we hear that we can't afford it with that kind of a background, you straight away say, hang on, that is simply not true. The history and the events don't bear it out whatsoever. So, so what we, so what we, we are perfectly able to uh, bring most industries into public ownership if we want at little or no cost. So let me uh, uh, look at the railways. As and when a rail company's franchise ends, you bring it into public ownership, and any profits which are made are then ploughed back, either for the benefit of of citizens or to invest in the service, water companies. If we were to enforce environmental standards, uh, that is to prevent these companies from uh, dumping shiploads of sewage into rivers and seas, and to ensure that they kept part of their bargain uh, to repair the leaks and invested in reservoirs. So in England, not a single new water reservoir has been built since 1990. These companies' profits would vanish. They would be bankrupt. You could take over them at virtually no cost whatsoever. As regards anything else, uh, <laughs> you will acquire an asset. So let's look at the private equity model. Private equity has recently taken over Asda Morrison's and it's made a mess of many other things too, but it has a business model. It loads the business it acquires with debt and that business then pays the interest on debt. That model is uh, really lauded by senior politicians and the city to say, OK, we'll apply the same model if we want to buy out BP or anybody else. We'll buy it, then load it with a debt, and the result, and the uh, instead of paying the interest and the profits to private agents, now these things can be brought into uh, public ownership. Uh, government has a capacity to create unlimited amount of money. And it has done so in the recent past, in the examples that I just cited. Yes. So if the government was to create new money to bring uh, entities into public ownership, it can do so. If it finds creation of that money creates inflation, it can then decide to withdraw some of the cash from the economy to combat that. And it can do so by taking the cash from those who are enjoying tax perks, for example. Capital gains at the moment are taxed at the rate of 10 to 28 percent, whereas the income tax rate on earned income is uh, from uh, 20 to 45 percent. Recipients of capital gains don't pay any national insurance either, even though they use the NHS and social uh, care. So if we were to tax capital gains at exactly the same rates as earned income, that would raise about 25 billion pound a year. You can apply the similar model to the, the recipients of dividends. You can go on and on, you know. So I mean, can I just come in? Because the, the thing is, that they they talk about windfall tax, that they, they'd be happy with, or, or, or tax on non-DOMs, and they say we'll fund whatever little things they're talking about with that. Who who are Labour prepared to tax? What What is it that they, they have a problem with that capital gains tax? Why won't they bring that one in? Why won't they mention those fair taxes that you're discussing? It is because of the right-wing coup. <laughs> you know, the right-wing coup was to privilege the interests of corporations, the rich, and capital, and basically clobber the working class. 
And so Labour is basically bought into that agenda. Some of that agenda continued during the Blair administration. For example, it privatized many things. It did not uh, increase the uh, rate of tax on recipients of capital gains or dividends. So those privileges are basically preserved. So when they talk about we, we don't want to raise taxes, what they are saying is we don't want to raise taxes on the rich. Taxes on ordinary people have been raised. You know, look at the current freeze on freezing of personal allowances uh, and the income tax thresholds. That has basically clobbered your average worker. So, so basically, it is that agenda. The mm. state has the capacity to change society. Political parties have that capacity. So if we look after the Second World War, at one stage, uh, after the, you know, as the UK had to be rebuilt, at one stage, the public debt was about 250% of GDP. Nobody said, oh, we must not reconstruct Britain. Everybody could see the need. And uh, by borrowing, if you like, uh, the government was able to build an economy and, and eventually uh, the public debt as a percentage of the GDP was considerably less. I think at one stage it was about 28%. So mm -hmm. it just frightening us. You know, I don't remember our grandparents going around and saying, oh my God, the government's got this amount of public debt, that is bad. Instead, people were saying, yeah, we got a bit of prosperity because the economy has been rebuilt. There's been investment. Yeah. So, so what's happened is part of this coup that I refer to, the state or the, uh, the, uh, the role of the state was fundamentally changed. It's become a guarantor of corporate profits. It is not an entrepreneurial state anymore. It is not investing in Concord, aerospace, biotechnology, information technology, new industries. It is not listening to the workers' needs. Uh, you know, many of our contemporary problems, if you look at the rate of inflation, are caused by industries which were privatized, energy, water, gas, electricity, railways. Yeah, so they're becoming a burden on, on, on us, aren't they? Well, look, thank you so much, Prem, for coming on. I've been listening to you for much longer, and, and you've always got ideas about how things could be better, um, and, and, and we'll keep um, promoting what you're saying, because... We're not hearing enough of that on the on the mainstream media. And um, thank you for coming on. Thank you.